Revelation 13, as we come to this portion of Scripture here, something we have already been discussing. In chapter 12 of Revelation, we've seen this attack against the people of God. We also see that this attack is a work of the enemy. We talked in great detail the last time we were here in Revelation 12 concerning Satan's ability, his authority, his power to, to rule for a time, his authority limited, his, his reach. It's not only through his fallen angels or demons, as we say, but also his reach is to world leaders and nations. Satan has a way of working through these things to fulfill his purpose. And what we see in chapter 12 is really a picture of this entire fight that is taking place in what we would call the spiritual realm, right? So Satan, in chapter 12, comes at this woman that appears here who is with child, and she cries out in labor pains to give birth. And Satan here desires this dragon, which is really Satan himself. The description is given in um, verse 9. The great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old, called the devil, and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast on the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So, Really, this is a picture of Satan's overall attack against Israel, against the Messiah, that is the child born to the woman here. And then we have this revelation with Michael, the angel in heaven, the warrior angel as we call him, Michael the archangel. And he fights with Satan, he fights with the dragon. Now remember, this is not some... Two angels that didn't know each other that now have finally found this battlefield in heaven. No, these are Satan, the devil, is a fallen angel, believed to be perhaps maybe one of the archangels that God had created. And we looked at passages like Ezekiel 28 that gives some description in verse 12 concerning Lucifer, that anointed cherub of old, in other words, anointed angel set apart by God for a task, for a purpose. And this revelation that he walked among the very sacred places of the Lord, it says there, until iniquity was found in your heart. Isaiah gives the same type of description on Satan in Isaiah chapter 14 in verse 12. And it talks about his desire. The iniquity in his heart was that in Isaiah 14, was that he would be like God. And so Satan's desire is to really destroy the work of God. And if Satan cannot, like he tried to with Adam and Eve, destroy those created in the image of God, but failed to destroy God's purpose and plan, and then his attack ensued, continued upon trying to attack everything that would believe to be that which would usher in the Messiah, Jesus. So we see this, and we've kind of been looking at these things on Sunday morning as we're working our way through the Exodus. But chapter 12 kind of sets the stage for chapter 13. Because what we see here is Satan... He failed to destroy the woman in chapter 12. In other words, he failed to destroy Israel. He lost that battle. And the fury of Satan, the fury of the dragon that we see here was greater. After he even lost this battle in heaven with, with Michael and he was cast out of heaven, so to speak. Um, remember, this is more in what is known as the tribulation period. And so there come a point where Satan has no access. And you ask the question, does Satan have access right now? According to the book of Job, he does. So this 
battle between Satan and Michael in verse 7 of chapter 12 is something future where Satan will have access to heaven removed. In the book of Job in chapter 1, it speaks of Satan's access before the throne of God in heaven. He's there. And we see it again in the very next chapter, chapter 2 of Job. And this is why in chapter 7 of the book of Hebrews in verse 25, it stated that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father forever making intercession for you and me. So as Satan is the accuser of the brethren, as he accuses us day and night, Jesus is praying for us day and night. And so the battle then will in a sense be kind of hurled down to the earth here after this defeat here. So we see here that it, it fanned into flame a greater fury in Satan to say, not only will I still try to destroy the woman, the people of Israel, because that's who the woman is there in Revelation 12. He chose to make war, the Bible says, with the rest of her offspring. And the rest of her offspring, obviously, in this day are those who, after the rapture of the church, during the time of the tribulation, through God's miraculous work of like 144,000 being sealed by God to do a work for God, the two witnesses of Revelation 11, we're also going to see the angels who, who preach an everlasting gospel. There's going to be people turning to the Lord. Israel, for the most part, will for the first time acknowledge Jesus as their Messiah as a result of the tribulation period. So who are those that the dragon or Satan will make war with probably the followers of the Lamb. And notice something here with being those of the follower of the Lamb that he can find throughout the earth in that time. Jews, obviously, that have now responded. Jesus is Hamashiach, that he is Messiah. Gentiles alike, who have seen this miraculous work and, and the rest of the offspring, clearly, uh, people who will most likely reject what is going to happen in chapter 13. Things get more, let's say, severe, and a line is actually drawn in the sand in chapter 13. But the reference really is to those who have, it says in verse 17 of chapter 12, to those who, have, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So the attack goes to them. These are witnesses of Jesus, followers of Jesus. And the idea here, the phrase to wage war, is the same expression used in chapter 11 and verse 7 with the attack on the two witnesses. And we also see it in chapter 13 and in verse 7 on the attack against the saints. So although the devil didn't destroy the woman or her child that she gave birth to, really talking about Israel, the child being Jesus. Satan was not able to destroy that work. He was unable to totally exterminate Israel. Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 8 informs us that quite a bit of the people of Israel, two-thirds of the Jewish population will be wiped out during the tribulation period. Satan will not succeed in wiping out God's people from the face of the earth, but he will succeed in plunging many to their death. But he will not take them out. And this is why Satan indeed hates the righteous remnant of God. And this is why the battle is so, so severe. Now, chapter 13 doesn't calm down. It just begins to grow. It begins to build up. And notice here that John sees another sign. He sees another sign. He begins to see <clears throat> this image coming up out of the sea. 
Now, I think the imagery here is important for us to consider in this text because we see that Satan's desire is to be powerful, it's to be great. But what we're going to see here in the first couple of verses, in verses 1 and 2, is Satan's work, not only throughout the earth in this day, but through evil individuals, governments, kingdoms, empires, if you will, to advance one purpose, and that's his kingdom. And if you look at Ezekiel 28, it's there in Ezekiel 28 where we also see a word to the king of Tyre. And what's interesting here is that we see kind of in a sense the prophet Ezekiel is giving us a description of Satan, but he's also speaking concerning a man, a king, a leader. So the imagery in the word of Ezekiel 28 is in reference to both a man and a nation. It's both in reference to not only a man and a nation, but it's also in reference to Satan and a nation. And the idea behind this is that Ezekiel 28 reveals to us that Satan has the ability to influence and empower kings and kingdoms and dominate for a time and a season to advance his kingdom. Now remember that if you look back at chapter 9 of Revelation, what do you see? There the bottomless pit is, is open up and we see that authority is given. Authority is given. Remember that the keys are given to one to open the bottomless pit. Now remember that the power that they have, number one, was given to them, and number two, it's limited. Remember that God gives these locusts that come out of this bottomless pit, remember this, the keys are given to the bottomless pit. The one who leads this group doesn't have the keys himself. So this reminds us that Satan's ability, Satan's power over the demon realm or the demon world as we call it, it's a real world, it's there. Their power is given, it's limited. So, you know, there's this false assumption that Satan has greater power than God. He doesn't, he never has, never will. It just, it'll, there, there's no way that can happen. It would go against everything that the Bible teaches. There's not even a notion. Well, some would say, but doesn't the Bible say he's the prince of the power of the air? He's the God of this age. Yes, in this fallen world, Satan's rule is through sin and the bondage of sin. And this is what Jesus Christ came to conquer, death and the grave. This is why Satan's attack against Israel and her child, let's say Jesus, is so great because it is really the end, the beginning of the end for Satan's reign. But his reign is limited. His power is given. And it even goes on to say here that they were not given authority to kill them, verse 5 of chapter 9, but to torment them five months. Notice they didn't even have the authority or the power to take their lives. But they were to torment men. Notice what else goes on to say that they would also do this for a period of time. If this would happen for, it says here, five months, it would torment them. So power given, their power is limited, and this really describes Satan. Well, Satan has the ability to deceive in so many ways, and even more so, a heart that is weak and not strong in the Lord. When we think of this term here of, you know, Satan and the demons and spiritual warfare, sometimes we think of a battle that is, that is distant from us. No, it is among us. And the battle's going to get worse. The days are going to get darker. Evil will grow. And we're going to see the work of the enemy as time is shortened. The closer we get, we're going to see the work of the enemy on the rise. You're going to see these things becoming more and more before our very eyes. This is what chapter 13 is all about. What we see here in verse 1, your attention please, it says, And I stood on the sand 
of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horn were ten crowns, and on his head a blasphemous name. Verse 2 says, Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion, and the dragon, notice here, the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Notice the dragon is none other than what verse 9 describes here, that the dragon is the serpent of old. Who was that serpent of old? Satan, Garden of Eden, the serpent in the Garden of Eden. There it is, that serpent of old. And other descriptions, the devil, Satan, who deceives the whole world. This is one of Satan's devices that is probably the most effective right here. Deceives, deception. And he deceives not just a part, but he deceives, notice what it says here, the whole world. And today we see deception in, in, in great ways. And many that we thought would never be deceived are being deceived. In chapter 13, we're going to see this figure rise into power known as the Antichrist. When we think of the word Antichrist, what are some of the words that people describe in their minds? You know, evil and, you know, this wicked person and this ruler. And we have enough, you know, Christian movies <laughs> on the end times to show us like who this figure is. He's always the evil one. Dressed really nice in a suit, right? But has that look about him that's just like, ah, there's something evil about that man. But, you know, I don't think that that's what we're going to see in the Antichrist. I think it's going to be great deception. When we see here the beast coming up out of the sea in Revelation 13 in verse 1, the origin really of this beast is the bottomless pit. Notice what the Bible says here in regards to the beast. It says that, he has a throne. This is the same one who ascends out of the bottomless pit and will make war against them. Revelation chapter 11 and verse 7, it says, When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them and overcome them and kill them. Now remember, this is the Antichrist who will kill the two witnesses because of their message totally against the work of the Antichrist. But notice his origin, where he comes from out of this bottomless pit. And really this speaks of one who is coming, not any time in our present time, but, but in a future date. Remember, the tribulation is, as we kind of label it, the last seven years of world history as we know it. It's after the rapture of the church, the tribulation period begins, and then after the tribulation ends, after seven years, the second coming of Jesus Christ takes place. And Christ rules and reigns. And we are here on this earth for a thousand years with Christ, known as the millennial reign of Christ, and we rule and reign with him. And though he has been preceded by many forerunners, there have been many that have come. Notice what 1 John says, or John the Apostle says in 1 John, and he talks about this very clearly as John kind of highlights this. He says, little children, 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, it is the last hour, and as you have heard, that the Antichrist is coming, even now, Many antichrists have come by which we know that it is the last hour. So he's not only saying that there's just this one. No, many have come. He states it again in chapter 4 and in verse 3 of 1 John chapter 4, verse 3. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And that is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. Notice what's already in the world is the spirit of Antichrist. Now, when John wrote his epistle here, he wasn't saying the Antichrist was alive in his day. He's just saying the spirit of the Antichrist is here. 
Notice what the spirit of the Antichrist is. He gives you a description. You might say, how can I identify the spirit or, or the message of the Antichrist, so to speak? What is this? What is, how does it look? Very simple. He says this. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ, listen to this, has come in the flesh is not of God. Jesus Christ not coming in the flesh. Well, who's Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is God. This is what John's saying here. And those who don't believe that Jesus is God, and you got people who call themselves Christians, carry Bibles, and don't believe that Jesus is God. And he says, whoever does not confess this, does not confess that the Christ has come in the flesh. Remember what John chapter 1 says? In verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The question that everybody asks, who is the Word? Look down at verse 14 of John chapter 1. And the Word became flesh, and He dwelt among us, as only begotten of the Father. Think about that. He dwelt among us. He made His abode. He pitched His tent among us. And we beheld his glory as only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That word, the Bible says in verse 1 of John's gospel, John chapter 1 in verse 1, that word is none other than Jesus, but John is saying that Jesus is God. And he says, and God came in the flesh through the person of Christ. And here he's writing and reiterating this important truth, but Anyone who rejects that Jesus is God has the spirit of Antichrist. And see, sometimes we think that the people who reject this are unbelievers. Right away, we can think of people, well, there's people that don't believe in God. Listen, there are people who profess to believe in God and still preach this lie. They profess the faith. What John is describing in his epistle in 1 John in chapter 4 is he's really describing the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Did you know that the spirit of error where people get it wrong about Jesus, this is why, you know, some people say, man, you guys just, you know, you teach through the Bible and then what do you do when you finish a book? We start another book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And what happens when you're finished with the whole Bible? We start all over again. That's what we're doing here, Right. We're already getting in our second run in the beginning of the Old Testament and working our way through the Bible, the New Testament. We're on our third run through the New Testament. So what are you going to do until Jesus comes back? Teach the Bible chapter by chapter, verse by verse, line upon line, precept upon precept. Well, why would you do that? Because it's God's word. It's not my word. It's not man's word. It's the living word of God. It still changes and transforms lives. It still does a work that, that only God can do through his word. And what does Satan want you to do? Oh, you don't got to believe that word. It's one of his devices. We always have to refer back to this. Don't get caught up in this stuff. He deceived Eve in the Garden of Eden. What did he say? Did God really say that? Many have come. John also follows this up in 2 John. And notice what he puts here in verse 7. In 2 John, in verse 7, he says this, For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. The word antichrist actually means against God. It doesn't appear in Revelation, but what we see here in the apocalypse, he's called the beast. We also see elsewhere in scripture, jot it down, Daniel chapter seven, the Antichrist is referred to there, not as the Antichrist, but as the little horn that will rise into power. Listen to this as Daniel gives this imagery of the end times. He speaks of the Antichrist, identifying him there in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 8. We also see it in 
the, uh, the prophecy of the 70 weeks of Daniel in Daniel chapter 9 in verses, or verse 26. The prince, the ruler who is to come. And it's interesting because when you look at Daniel chapter 9, look at verses 25 and 26. Just look at it and pay attention. The word prince is used in both of the verses. But notice the first time it's used, it's speaking about Jesus, the prince of peace. But notice that the word prince is capitalized. In verse 26 of Daniel 9, well, it's speaking about the Antichrist. Look at the word prince there. It's not capitalized because it's not speaking of anything divine. It's speaking of the man of sin, the Antichrist. We also see in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we read this, I believe, the last time we were here in Revelation, and I read to you 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 in verses 3 through 8. Jot it down for your note-taking, but... There, the Antichrist is described as the lawless one or the man of sin. It's a term for the Antichrist. John obviously speaks here of those who reject Christ coming in the flesh as Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist and one who practices the works of the Antichrist. So you could see here, as John is giving this description, he refers to it time and time again throughout his epistle, 1st and 2nd John. And what he's really saying is one who is against Christ or really what Revelation 13 is going to promote in its day, one who is in the place of Christ. Because remember, that was Satan's desire, to be like God, to be in the place of God. See, the Antichrist is a work of Satan. Now, the Antichrist, we're going to see throughout the book of Revelation, you're going to see this thing about the Antichrist. You're, you're going to see him referred to as a person, but you're also going to see the Antichrist referred to as a region of the world, perhaps, a place, a nation, a people. You're also going to see the Antichrist referred to as a religious system, kind of like what John is doing here. He's saying, hey, listen, if you reject that Christ Jesus has come in the flesh, the spirit of Antichrist is there. So he's not specifically talking about a person per se that we know as the Antichrist, but he's talking about the spirit of the Antichrist. So you're going to see that symbolism and that interchangeable uh, practice in Revelation as well. But in chapter 13 of Revelation, we're speaking about this Antichrist who will be this ruler. In Daniel chapter 9, in verse 26, it says that this ruler will rule for three and a half years. And this is where we are. We're midway point in the tribulation in Revelation chapter 13. So the beast is an anti-Messiah. You know that today we live in a very anti-Messiah world. Part of this is anti-Semitism, and we see it. The hate of Jews throughout the world. And this is not new to the Jewish people. You know, historically, we look back and we see the genocide of the Jewish people that attempt by none other than Hitler himself. But all throughout the history of the people of Israel, removed from their land, regathered back into the land, they were once a kingdom and a world power at one time under the rule of not only King David, but Solomon as well. Then the kingdoms divided, Gentile kingdoms and nations subjected them because they forsook the Lord their God and turned to idolatry rather than trusting in the Lord. And yet of all the people in the world, God regathered them back into their land and in 1948, Israel becomes a nation. Now, I think this is really important for us to understand because, you know, there's been many things that have changed over the years, even with this view of Israel. Now, I want you guys to understand that when we say we support Israel and we're behind Israel and we're praying for the peace of Jerusalem, what we are saying is we are in support of what God is in support of. We're not saying that we look at Israel because anti-Semitism, yes, that's one aspect that we see 
or anti-Messiah that we see in the world. The other part is the Jews themselves who reject Jesus as their Messiah. They're blinded right now. And there's a purpose for God's blinding them. Just like there was a purpose for him removing them out of the land. He did it twice. The northern kingdom, he did it by the Assyrian Empire in 722 BC. The southern kingdom, he did it with the Babylonian Empire in 586 BC. It started in 605 BC. And King Nebuchadnezzar dominated the southern kingdom of Israel and took many captive. Destroyed the temple in 586 BC. And from that point, for 70 years, the people were captive in Babylon. Well, who ruled in Jerusalem? Who ruled in Israel? Gentile nations and kingdoms. And it wasn't until 535 BC that they're under a, Mer uh, a Medo-Persian king that the people of Israel were let out of their captivity and were able to go back into the land. And it wasn't until 16, 15, 16 years after that, 516 BC, that they were able to rebuild the second temple. And that is the same temple that stood in Jesus' day. The one that Jesus said would one day be destroyed. Jesus made that statement at about 32 AD, 33 AD, and the temple was destroyed about 40 years later in 70 AD. And then the Bible, as we were in the book of the prophet Ezekiel, says there's going to be a third temple. The last eight chapters of Ezekiel, chapters 40 to 48, speak of a third temple. And we also seen in Revelation 11, a third temple. And today... There's no third temple. The temple, the third one, will serve as a place where the Antichrist will declare himself to be God to the world. And so you have Jews rejecting Jesus as their Messiah. You have the anti-Semitic world that is against the Jewish people. You have a church that's saying, we love the people of Israel. Why do we love Israel? Because we know that the people of Israel, God's purpose and plan, he's not done with them. When you read Revelation, or excuse me, Romans chapters 9 through 11, you'll see that God is not done with Israel. The world wants God to be done with Israel. Remember there in chapter 12 of Revelation, what do we see here? One of the attacks of the enemy, and we just seen this recently, when, when he's attacking the woman, and the woman was given two wings, it says in verse 14, of a great eagle that, he, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and a times and half a time. That's three and a half years. From the presence of the serpent, the devil. Notice what it says in verse 15. So the serpent, Satan, spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman. You know that this is how all the great persecution of God's people starts? With words. And the people, the Jewish people, have been subjected. And this anti-Semitic rhetoric, this hate for Jewish people today, you're seeing it. You turn on the news, you see it. And it's being accepted in some of our most intellectual Ivy League colleges. And they fail to realize they're being used by Satan to spew this hate. You see, guys, what keeps me dumbfounded as a pastor is when I see people come to church day in and day out and don't even see that the spirit of Antichrist is everywhere. And it's like everybody's fixated on, hey, do you think Barack Obama's the Antichrist? I could care less who the Antichrist is. I'm not gonna be here when he rises into power. You could stay behind and find out who it is. I'm out of here. But even Satan uses that to deceive. And people get so fixated and they start looking at every little thing, you know, and, 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 and everything that's happening. Listen, I watch the news and I see what's going on, not because I'm trying to look for Bible verses like, oh, that was in the Bible, that rocket that hit that building, that was in the Bible. And I come out with all the, I, listen, I don't got time for that. If I do that, I will stray from the truth of God's word. 
And I will start to look at every single thing and think, oh, there's a demon behind that. And there's this. Be Listen, you missed the whole point. God didn't tell me to put the pieces together and figure out for you guys who the Antichrist is and what his name is. God's called me to preach the gospel and win souls for the kingdom because time is short. But we have to be aware. You guys got to see this. Don't be distracted. And so when I watch these things, all I see is it's like the word unfolding before my very eyes. And you can ask my wife. I'll be watching the news and, you know, it'll be on a certain thing or a certain event. And then I'll be like, you know, there's a verse in the Bible that says that this is going to happen. She's like, no way. I'm like, dude, check it out. <laughs> and I says, you know, I'm not saying this is what's happening. Like this is the verse. But you see how? And she has the same thoughts and questions that I have. How come people don't know this? How come there's no urgency in their hearts? I have to say it, and I'm going to say it to you first. Deceived. Is that too hard for you to swallow? You don't think you're deceived? Wake up, church. Every day I have to pray because I don't need some antichrist or some false teacher to deceive me. I can deceive myself. Nobody deceives Satan. Iniquity was found in him. He wanted to be like God. Self-idolatry. Understand, guys, that Satan's Greatest, you might think, oh man, the devil's after me. He's chasing me. He put this in my path. He put that in my path. Oh, these thoughts in my... And you start giving him all this credit. <laughs> That's all you, boo-boo. Just so you know. That's all you. That is your sinfulness. That is what's in you that God, by the power of the Spirit, is desiring to work out of you. But until that day, you will battle that. And on top of you fighting really the flesh and the work of the flesh that is so weak. Jesus says your flesh is weak. You have this deception. It's, it's crazy, but what else? Well, this powerful figure here has, notice what it says here, seven heads and ten horns. When you look at this here, you you begin to really look at this and say, okay, what is the understanding of the Antichrist? Well, as I stated earlier, earlier, it's multifaceted. Sometimes the spirit of Antichrist or the Antichrist can be in the person. It could be in a religious system. It could be in a, 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 a people, a nation that, that the enemy might use, an evil empire or political power. We see this here. You'll see it also in uh, verse 17, that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. That's a system. That is a political power. We also see it as a past and present impersonable force. A presence, a spirit, an evil spirit of this age. That's what John said, the spirit of the Antichrist. And also literal persons who are forerunners to the final Antichrist. And then we see the final climactic embodiment of the satanic power in great work and in opposition to God in a person known as the Antichrist himself. We'll see the beast and the Antichrist kind of overlap at times times in political power and times in a person at the same time. It's not that all unusual. What John is trying to give us to understand is saying, be aware, Satan has many ways of deceiving. You're going to be looking for the Antichrist in a person and Satan's deceiving you with the spirit of Antichrist and you have no clue that you're deceived and you're being taken this way. Guys, come on, man, be aware. This is what John's trying to do the best that he possibly can. And he's saying, listen, I don't know how to explain it to you, but Boy, when it comes, it is going to come. This is why discernment is so key and so important that we need it in our hearts and in our lives. I ask you a question for the second time. Are you deceived tonight? 
you think of evil, you think of the evil of Nazi Germany, you think immediately of who? Hitler. Think about this. Throughout history, there have been many candidates for the Antichrist. Boy, I know you guys are itching for me to say who I think it is. I'm going to tell you right now so you can stop and focus on the message. I don't know. But I know he's coming. And if he's not on his way, he's already here. Where, when, how, I don't know, I don't care. What I care more about is the proclamation of the gospel while the church age is still here. How do you know the church age is still here? Ah, uh, we're here. Now look at this for a moment that I want you guys to get here in the passage before us. It's, it's giving us some revelation in verse 2 and, and this description of the leopard and the bear and the lion, you know, and the dragon. Remember this imagery, some would say in a sense this picture of this, this beast. Well, well, who is it? Here, the Antichrist is pictured as these images of these world empires. Because remember that in the book of Daniel, the leopard is none other than, uh, you know, the Grecian Empire and the bear, the Medo-Persian Empire and the lion, the Babylonian Empire. And it's not in the same order that you see in the book of Daniel, but you see the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. So this reveals to us here, really, this idea of rulers being used by the enemy. Nations, today, there are nations that are being used by the enemy. Look at the evil of the nations that surround Israel. Everybody thinks, oh, you know, that's Islam, it's evil, but it's what's behind Islam that's evil. It's Antichrist. There's evil nations and evil rulers that, that are being judged right now, and being wiped out, and we have the world, for the most part, defending this and saying that we're wrong for supporting this. We are in an age where bad is called good and good is called evil, bad. And the church is getting it wrong. I see it. I, I'm, I'm saddened to see even within our own tribe. And when I say our own tribe, I say Calvary Chapel, where you have some that have been distracted and are, and are going off on this tangent and this belief that, that Israel is not who the Bible describes it to be. I affirm and I hold to the truths of the distinctives of Calvary Chapel. And I've always believed what Pastor Chuck has taught us concerning Israel. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And one day God will redeem the people of Israel in the tribulation period for those that turn to Jesus and acknowledge him as the true Messiah of Israel. But until then, what do we do? Because for a moment, according to Romans, God has blinded Israel because it's the time of the Gentiles. It's this dispensation of the church age and the gospel is going forth so Gentiles can come to faith in Christ. And when the church is taken up, that dispensation, that time is over and God will focus his attention on Israel and God will use the affliction and the brutality and the cruelty of the Antichrist against his people to get their attention to where they have nowhere else to turn but God. It's historically what happens to God's people. He did it to them while they were in Egypt. The affliction caused them to turn to God and cry out. So we see here that the teaching on the Antichrist in the Bible is not to provoke or intend to provoke our speculation on who he is, but rather, I think it's God's design to instruct us now and in every generation concerning what the Antichrist does and how the Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist and all of that, how they work and what they do. And where the power comes from, comes from Satan himself. Notice this. 
So in other words, what the text seems to do is it seems to enlighten us on Satan's devices and the strategies of Satan. So we see here very clearly him working through this, these empires, if you will, these individuals. So Satan works behind not only a man. You see here the seven heads. The number seven in the Bible is completeness. We see horns, a picture of authority. Later on, you're going to see these seven heads are referred to as seven heels. There's only one city that was built on seven hills that is known for that. It's Rome. It could be speaking of a revived Roman empire. And here are these 10 horns, uh, this, this rulership within this empire. Really what's in view here, authority and power given to 10 kings or kingdoms. You know, at one point people thought that this was uh, the, the United Nations or the European Union until both of those groups grew beyond 10 nations. But whatever the case might be, we know that this is going to be world power involvement, but under one authority. They're all coming from the beast. Notice what else, and on his head, a blasphemous name. Well, what is blasphemy? Anything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. I doubt in this day you're going to see anything on our currency or anything on any place saying, in God we trust. And if it does say it, it's not going to be the God in which we think it says. He says, and I saw one of his heads as if it had been, notice here, mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. Now, I want you to understand what we're seeing here in this imagery here. We see this, the source of, of this power of this dragon as the bottomless pit. But we also see that the Antichrist with all of this power from Satan and the evils of this world, we see here this description in verse 3 saying that there is a short reign. There is a mortal wound. Mortally means when it says, you know, it, it, was, you know, it was mortal, meaning death. Wounded, it doesn't really make sense. Two words that are opposite. Mortally, meaning this, you know, leading to death and wounded, saying it's still alive. And his deadly wound, notice what it says here, was healed. In the original language, the idea here is death and alive at the same time. The only way we can describe this is that this somehow, some way will be viewed by those that see the Antichrist being mortally wounded. We're going to see that he will somehow cheat death, but it'll be reported that he has died. Perhaps here, this wounding in the head could be an assassination attempt. You know, when... There was this attempt on the former president, you know, I was looking at this and I says, boy, that would be a trip if this guy was the Antichrist. He fits the bill, <laughs> but he's not. But that world leader in that day, the Antichrist, will have a wound to his head. And most likely, as we've seen even in our current times, kind of like they attempted to assassinate former President Trump more than once. The same happened with Ronald Reagan. JFK was assassinated. Assassination for the presidents of this nation has been common throughout the history of this nation in its short period of time, less than 300 years. But you go through first and second kings in the Bible and you see all the kings that ruled in the northern and southern kingdom. And in the northern kingdom, it was one assassination after another. But somehow this is going to happen to the Antichrist. He's going to have this issue take place. And this is where the authority, this is where the power is going to be given in the sense that it's going to cause many to follow. So after John gives this description, like Daniel chapter 7, where he begins to draw from the vision of Daniel and begins to give this order and, and remember, the order is kind of backwards, like I told you. It's not in the same order of Daniel. And the reason being is perhaps maybe because it's giving us an idea of how John is looking. John is looking back to Daniel 7. 
Whereas Daniel 7 is looking ahead to John's day. And that could very well be the case. But here's what we do know, is that somehow, some way, the Antichrist will be wounded to death, and then there will be like this thing where they say, he died, but he's now been raised from the dead. He has power, he has a throne, and he has great authority. A.T. Robertson put it this way, the dragon works through this beast. This beast is simply Satan's agent being used by the devil. And so Satan claims kind of like the power that Christ would have. Remember what Satan offered Jesus. He offered him power. He offered him a throne. He offered him great authority. Jesus rejected and refused all of it. Jesus called Satan the prince of this world in John chapter 12 and verse 31. Jesus rejected it. The Antichrist receives it. This great imposter, this wannabe God-like man will never be God. But what we see here is this counterfeiting of the resurrection like Jesus who died and three days later came back to life. God raised him from the dead. The Antichrist will be mortally wounded and he will die and then he will be healed and all the world will marvel and follow the beast. Think about this. Now, it's not real in the sense here. This, this miracle will, will cause many to follow. And, and how will this happen? Does Satan have the power to raise the dead? Or could it be that the world is perhaps fooled, deceived? I think that it could be that. This deception will be so great. Today in the world of AI, you can make anything say or do. This is why this is, we're coming into this age, guys. It's, you might say, well, you know, you're into all that sci-fi stuff. No, I'm not, but it's real. You see it, it's there. And it's only going to, gain momentum. It's only going to become more and more. This is how deception starts. Guys, as much as we like our electronic devices and our phones and social media and all those things like that, you know, the, the, the real spirit behind all of it is deception in its core. Everybody that's on social media gives this false assumption of what their lives are like. And then you really meet them and you realize like, that's not what your social media says. Well, we see that even more so the ability to, I mean, I'll give you guys a perfect example. It was obviously noted and found out, and it became headlines just a week ago, when the vice president who is running for presidency was interviewed by one of the news networks, and they edited on the fly as the interview was taking place what she was saying that made her look ignorant and like she didn't know it. On the fly, they edited it. Hello, guys, it's saying it was live. And by the time it was done, everybody's look, everybody is looking at it. They're like, how did that happen? Many believed that the edits are what she really said. It's mind-blowing. And, and it's only going to get... Greater, in other words, I don't even think I, AI is going to get more advanced in how we could say, man, it's going to become more intelligent. I think humanity is just going to be deceived more. Humanity will get more dumb, like dumb and dumber. And because they're not discerned and because they're not in the word and because they're not truly following Christ, they will be deceived. And you want to see deception at its finest? Well, just go watch the news tonight when you go home and just see what's going on with this presidential race. And you sit there and you decide and you listen to all these people. And I'm just like, man, Lord, and it's going to get worse. All these things. Satan's going to use all of this. 
And I believe this is what's going to happen with the Antichrist. So they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast. So now they're worshiping, uh, you know, a Satan and the Antichrist. And they worship the beast saying, who is like the beast who is able to make war with him? Wow. Notice here what Satan is doing. Counterfeit. A counterfeit worship. He wants to be like God. Here the Antichrist, the Greek word for wounded, this wound in the original language is really the word that's translated for slaughtered. It's going to be so real that people are truly going to believe this was miraculous. And only God can do miraculous things. So this individual must be divine or he must be God-like, hence the title Antichrist. And perhaps his death and his resurrection, vicariously living it out like the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It's interesting here because the word lived, the term is used really for Jesus' resurrection in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 8. So you have an imitated slaughter of Christ, so to speak, the death of Jesus, the Lamb of God. You have an imitation of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and you have imitated worship to the one true God and declaring who can be like him. A counterfeit death, a counterfeit resurrection taking place in the end of the age. And some believe that the resurrection of this, of this political figure here could be a revived Roman Empire. It could be the, the, the rulership of a kingdom that the Antichrist is over and it's going to revive into power. I believe it's a combination of both. It could speak of the rise of a nation and the rise of a person. John F. Wolvert, who I love and I've read a lot of his material on the topic of the end times and eschatology, writes this and I quote, the identification of the head with the government over which he has authority is not a strange situation. The person is often the symbol of the government, and what can be said of the government can be said of him. End quote. This clearly here is deception at its finest. And notice here the deception. Many follow. Take note of that. Many follow. Amazed at the appearance of a resurrection. The whole earth begins to submit to the authority because they believe this guy really was raised from the dead. So they worship the dragon. They worship Satan. And what's interesting here is the statements they begin to say, who is like the beast? Who is able to wage war against him? Wonder. As they marvel and wonder, it turns to worship. Divine worship is substituted by the devil's worship. Guys, you know that idolatry of the most terrible sort imaginable will now blanket the earth and people will begin to worship the Antichrist and say, who is like him? Something that is only spoken concerning the Lord, who is like God? We sang tonight, isn't he worthy? There's none. It's the Lord alone who is worthy. It's Jesus alone. God alone is incomparable. The beast here once more is usurping what belongs only to God. And guys, don't think, wow, well, you know, I, I'm glad I won't be here in that day and I won't see it. Listen, Satan desires not only in that day, but in this day to be worshipped and treated like God. He always has and he always will. And if he can distract you, him and his minions, and get you for a moment to be distracted, even when you claim to be walking with the Lord, but yet distracted, he's won. In this day, Satan's reign of terror will have specific characteristics. And we see it here in verses 5 and 8. And he was given a mouth speaking great and blasph great 
and blasphemies and was given authority to continue for 42 months, that's three and a half years. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have been not written or not been written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Notice that the beast is given a mouth to speak. Boastfully, blasphemous, he is given a mouth to directly by the dragon speak and ultimately is permitted to speak in essence by God because God is allowing this to take place. And so the Antichrist is going to have this dominion and this rule that eventually will come to an end. It'll be short lived, but there are those who desire to be deceived, who want to follow after the enemy, who are rejectors of God, who will have no problem with what's being said. But keep in mind, like the devil, notice that the devil is God's beast on a leash. Satan can only do what God allows him to do, can only go as far as God allows him to go. And it'll eventually come to an end. Notice what we see here. The object of his slanders are noted in verse 6. Blasphemies against his name, against the people of God, the name of God. The activity of the Antichrist, when we've seen it in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4, it says, he will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God, proclaiming himself to be God. The use of divine titles, blasphemous names, declaring himself to be greater Declaring himself to be deity, declaring himself to be God. This is nothing new. This has been Satan's devices all along. It'll go on for a sustained period of time, three and a half years, John says, 42 months. But not only will he speak against God and his people, he will also act against God and his people. We look at this and we say, this is an all too familiar story for the church. But take note of this, what he goes on to say in verse 10. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. I believe here this is more of a proverb. And it's reminding us that Believers whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Those who have been called by God, set apart by God. Listen, even in this day, know that deception, if you keep your eyes on the Lord, will not affect you. Persevere. This is what verse 10 is saying. Persevere. Endure till the end. God gives great gifts to those who overcome. But Don't just say, yes, I'll be prepared for that day. Begin to see it. See, the believer is doubly secure because the book of life belongs to the Lamb who had been slain. Those who not only through the decree of election, but also the atoning work of Christ is sealed by God and God alone. Who is powerful to break that seal? No one. This is simply an invitation to pay attention. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Tonight, how many of you here have an ear? How I many you have two? That's a double directive to you. You better hear what the Lord is saying. Persevere. I think it's important for us to understand here that even in this present time, though we're not in the tribulation and though we're not there, we persevere even now. Against the attacks of the enemy, that day is going to be far worse. And this should be the motivator in the proclamation of the gospel. 
Our motivation should come directly as this, to see that a time is going to come where it's going to be unbearable for some to stand in the truth of God's word. I know you probably want to know what the mark of the beast is. Next week we'll talk about that. Or the next time we're here in chapter 13. But for tonight, let's guard our hearts with all diligence, the Bible says. Knowing that a time is going to come where as you were deceived before you came to Christ, many will be deceived up until the coming of Christ. We don't know who the Antichrist is, but we know the spirit of Antichrist is here. John said it. And perhaps maybe the Antichrist himself, not realizing who he is, empowered by Satan at a certain point in time, midway in the tribulation, will rise into power. We're not going to be here for that. But everything we see in the world is coming to that. A one-world religion, a one-world currency. I mean, there's already this uh, religion unification that has already been taking place. I believe so far 35 known religions have already signed a decree, some Christians included, saying that the world will know true peace when all religions come together. It's not going to be a matter of denomination and gods. It's going to be a matter of faith. And that all faiths lead to God. I think we're getting there. And what you believe tonight and how you live tonight is going to be a lost art. But it's supposed to be that way.